I sometimes read uh, public domain books here on Leaves of Glen. And they were written a long time ago, uh, so they're usually uh, racist or sexist or bigoted. Uh, but in there somewhere and all that is a, a story, and that's why those stories are famous. Other times, I read uh, works from independent authors, and they're delightfully not racist, but they might have adult language or adult situations. So that's your warning, uh, but I'm sure you uh, are grown up enough to handle it. Don't write to me complaining. Hey, kids. I got nothing to say. I literally just recorded uh, a few hours ago. It's part of my Halloween uh, blitz of scary stories. So, um, between the last recording and now, I uh, picked up my kid from school and took her to her job. And uh, I'm squeezing this in before I, I go pick her up from her job and then bring her to her mom's. And then come back and record another podcast with Sweet Sweet Ben. That's it. I have nothing else to report. Uh, let's just go to the story. You uh, know what's big on TikTok right now? Uh, with the teens. Now, Charles Dickens, born the 7th of February, 1812, uh, died on the 9th of June, 1870. What is it that these kids are TikToking about? The little dances they do, uh, funny little skits. Well, they talk about when Charles Dickens was 12 years old, his father, a clerk in the Navy pay office named John Dickens, found himself with such debt uh, to pay off that he was actually forced into debtor's prison by the men whom he owed money. Charles's mother and his youngest siblings moved into the prison with John, uh, leaving Charles to struggle in poverty all by himself uh, with family friends. So there's a lot of odd dances that they do with that, with some, uh, some weird music. Uh, another thing was, I saw a guy in a parking lot uh, wearing a weird outfit as he pantomimed that during Dickens' lifetime, he kept a raven for a pet whom he named Grip. After Grip passed away, Dickens had his former pet stuffed, presumably so that he could put him on a bust, uh, you know, so that he could keep hanging around, croaking nevermore. <laughs> so that's odd. Uh, YouTube's not as big a deal as it used to be. Uh, you had uh, all the people that were in Vine, uh, they're on the Vine app. Uh, eventually, when Vine shut down, they all moved over to YouTube and kind of took over where all the vloggers were vlogging their life and stuff and it's pretty annoying to begin with i think it's a, an improvement to youtube especially uh when one youtuber did a whole thing on how one person found it in him to despise dickens writing as he's a renowned english romantic poet william wordsworth who was also a poet laureate for a time uh, wordsworth bragged about not having even given dickens writing a chance considering Dickens, uh, quote, very talkative and vulgar. Uh, and Dickens didn't hesitate to fire back, though, uh, decrying Wordsworth as a dreadful old ass. And I got this from Fun Facts. Uh, it's called Faxinate.com. So they put at the end of that, meow, because yeah, they're having a little cat fight. Well, that's fun. Let's get into the story. The Signalman by Charles Dickens. Hello, uh, below there. When he heard a voice thus calling to him, he was standing at the door of his box with a flag in his hand, furled around its short pole. Eh, one would have thought, considering the nature of the ground, that he could not have doubted from what quarter the voice came, but instead of looking up to where I stood on the top of the steep, uh, cutting nearly over his head, he uh, turned himself about and looked down the lane. There was something remarkable in his manner of doing so, though I could not have said that for what in my life, but I know it was remarkable enough to attract uh, my notice. Even though his figure was foreshortened and uh, shadowed, uh, down the deep trench and mine was high above him, so steeped in the glow of an angry sunset, I never heard it described that way, uh, that I had shaded my eyes uh, with my hand before I saw him at all. Uh, hello, uh, uh, below. That from looking down the lane, he turned himself about again and, raising his eyes, saw my figure above him. 
Is there any path by which I can come down and uh, sp uh, speak to you? Uh, he looked up at me without replying, and I looked down at him without pressing him too soon with a repetition of my idle question. Uh, just then, there came a, a vague vibration in the earth and the air, uh, quickly changing into a violent pulsation, an oncoming rush that caused me to start back as though it had forced drawn upon me down, uh, and such vapor as rose to my height, burp, from this rapid train, he passed me and was skimming away over the landscape. I looked down again and saw him uh, refurling the flag that he had shown while the train went by. I repeated my inquiry, and after a pause, during which he seemed to regard me with uh, fixed attention, he motioned with his rolled-up flag toward a point on my level at two, uh, two or three hundred yards distant. Uh, more detail that you absolutely do not need. I called him down, all right, uh, and made for the point. There, by dint of looking closely about me, I found a rough zigzag descending path notched out, which I followed. Again, more detail you just don't need. The cutting was extremely deep, don't need this detail, and unusually precipitate. Uh, it was made through a clammy stone, which became oozier and wetter as I went down. For these reasons, I found the way long enough to give me time to recall a singular air of reluctance or compulsion, uh, which he had pointed out the path. Don't need any of this. When I came down low enough upon the zigzag descent to see him, I saw he was standing between the rails on the way by which the train had lately passed, in, a, in an attitude, as if he were waiting for me to appear. Uh, he had left his hand at his chin, and his uh, left elbow rested on his right hand, uh, crossed over his breast. His attitude was one of such expectation and watchfulness that I stopped for a moment, wondering at it. Well, I resumed my downward way, and stepping out upon the level of the railroad and drawing him near, uh, saw that he was a dark, sallow man with a, with a dark beard and uh, rather heavy eyebrows. Uh, his post was as solitary and uh, dismal a place as ever I saw. On uh, either side, a dripping wet wall of jagged stone, excluding all view but a strip of sky, the perspective one way only a crooked prolong prolongation Weird that I had a tough time with that one. Prolongation of this great dungeon, the shorter perspective on the other direction, terminating in a gloomy red light and the gloomier entrance to a black tunnel, in whose massive architecture uh, there was a barbarous, depressing, and forbidding air. So little sunlight ever found its way uh, to this spot that it had, a, had a, an earthy, uh, deadly smell. I don't know what the sun prevented smell. And so much cold wind rushed through it that it struck chill to me as if I had left the natural world. Uh, before he stirred, I was near enough to him to have touched him. And not even then, removing his eyes from mine, he stepped back one step and lifted his hand. Uh, there was a, a lonesome post to occupy, I said, and it had uh, riveted my attention when I looked down from up yonder. A visitor was a rarity, I should suppose, and not an unwelcome rarity, I hoped, question mark. In me, he merely saw a man who had been shut up within narrow limits all his life, and who, being at last set free, had a newly awakened interest in these great works. To such purpose, I spoke to him, but I am far from sure of the terms I use, for besides that, I am not happy in opening any conversation. There was something in the man that daunted me. His, uh, it directed a most curious look toward the red light near the tunnel's mouth and looked all about it as if something were missing from it. And then, uh, and then looked at me. That light was part of his charge? Question mark. Was it not? Question mark. He answered in a low... Oh, there's no quotes? Oh, okay. I was going to say, are they just not doing quotes in the story so you don't know when someone's talking? But here's one. He answered in a low voice. Uh, don't you know it is? The monstrous thought came to my mind as I perused to fixed eyes and saturine face. That was a spirit, not a man. I speculated since whether there may have been infection in his mind. In my turn, I stepped back, but making the action, I detected in his eyes some latent fear of me. Ah, this put monstrous thought to flight. Uh, you look at me, I said, forcing a smile, as if you had a, a, a dread of me. Oh, I was doubtful, he returned, whether I had uh, seen you before. Now, where? And he pointed the red light that he looked at. There, I said. Intently watchful of me, he replied, uh, but without sound, in parentheses, Yes! My good fellow, 
What should I do there? However, be that as it may, I never was there. You may swear. I think I may, he rejoined. Yes, I'm sure I may. His manner cleared, uh, like my own. He replied to my remarks with readiness and in well-chosen words. He had uh, much to do there? Yes. That was to say he had enough responsibility to bear, but exactness and watchfulness were not what he required of him. In actual work, manual labor, he had next to none. To change that signal, and to trim those lights, and to turn this iron handle now and then, just back and forth, back and forth. And that was all he had to do uh, under that head, regarding those many long and lonely hours of which I seem to make so much. I can only say that the routine of his life had shaped itself into that form, and and he had grown used to it. He taught himself a language down here, if only to know it by sight, and have formed his own uh, crude ideas of its pronunciation. Uh, he could be called learning it. He had also uh, worked at fractions and decimals and, and tried a yeah, little algebra, <laughs> but he was and has been a boy, a poor hand at figures. Was it necessary for him, when on duty, always to remain at the channel of damp air, and he could never rise into the sunshine from between those high stone walls. Why, what depended upon time and circumstances. Under uh, some conditions, uh, there would be less upon the line than in others. Uh, same held good as certain hours of the day uh, and night. In a bright weather, he did choose occasions for getting a little above these lower shadows. But uh, being at all times liable uh, to be called by his electric bell and at all times listening for it with uh, redoubled anxiety, and the relief was less than I could suppose. <sighs> I like the signalman. I think I read this a long time ago, but it's bugging me now. He took me into his box, and there was a fire, and a desk, and an official book for which to make certain entries, uh, a telegraphic instrument uh, with its dial, face, and needles, and a, oh, and a little bell of which he had spoken. Well, on my uh, trusting that he would excuse the remark that he had been well-educated, and I hoped I might say without offense, perhaps educated above that station. He observed that instances of slight incongruity in such wise would rarely be found wanting among large bodies of men, that he had heard it was so in the workhouses, then the police force, and even in the last desperate resource, the army. And he knew it was so, uh, more or less, in any great railway staff, he had been, uh, when young, if I could believe it, sitting in that hut, he seriously could, a student of natural philosophy, and attended lectures, but he had, had run wild, misused his opportunities, gone down, uh, and never risen again. He had no complaint to offer about that, and he made his bed, and he lay upon it. It's far too late to make another. All that I have here condensed, he said in quite a manner with his dark his grave dark regards divided between me and the fire. He threw the word sir uh, from time to time, and especially when referred to his youth, as though to request me to understand that he claimed to be nothing but what I found him. He was several times interrupted by a, a little bell uh, and had uh, to read off messages and send replies. Once he had to stand without the door and display a flag as a train passed, and to make some verbal communication to the driver in the exchange of his duties, I observed him to be remarkably exact and vigilant, breaking off his discourse at a syllable and remaining silent until what he had to do was done. Uh, in a word, I should have... There, just get to the story. He's going to tell a scary story. In a word, I should have set this man down as one of the safest men to be employed in that capacity. But for the circumstance uh, that while he was speaking to me, he twice broke off uh, with a fallen color, hmm. and his face turned toward the little bell, which did not ring, and that's in all caps, opened the door of the hut, which was kept shut to exclude uh, the unhealthy damp, and looked out toward the red light near the mouth of the tunnel. On both of those occasions, he came back to the fire with an inexplicable air upon him, which I had remarked without being able to define when we were so far asunder. Said I, when I rose to leave him, uh, you almost make me think that I've met a, a contented man. And I'm afraid I must acknowledge that I said it to lead him on, in parentheses. Oh, I believe it used to be so, he rejoined in a low voice, which he had first spoken. But I am troubled, sir, I am troubled. He would have recalled the words if he could, and he had said them, however, and I took them up quickly. With what? Uh, what's your trouble? 
Yeah, it's difficult to impart, sir. It's very, very difficult to speak of. If you ever uh, make me another visit, I will try to tell you. But I express the intent to make you another visit. Uh, say, when shall it be? Oh, I go off early in the morning, and I shall be on again at ten tomorrow night, sir. I will come at eleven. Now he thanked me. He went out the door with me. Now I'll show you my white light, sir, he said in a particular low voice, until you found the way up. When you found it, uh, don't call out. Yeah. And when you're at the top, uh, don't call out. His manner seemed to make the place strike colder to me. But then I said no more than, uh, very well. And when you, when you come down tomorrow night, uh, uh, don't call out. Uh, let me ask you a party question. Uh, what, what made you cry hello below there tonight? I have a nose, I said. I cried that to, to that effect. Oh, not to that effect, sir. Oh, those are the very words. I know them well. Admit those were the very words I said them, no doubt, because I saw you below. Eh, uh, for no other reason. What other reason could I possibly have? You had no, uh, feeling that they were conveyed to you in any, uh, mm, supernatural way? No. He wished me good night. He held up his light. And I walked by the side down the line trails, which are a very disagreeable sensation of the train coming behind me, until I found the path. It was easier to mount than to descend, and I got back to my inn without any adventure. I'm surprised he didn't describe the path again as his way up. Punctual to my appointment, I placed my foot on the first notch of the zigzag next night. Now, here we go. And the distant clocks were striking 11. He was waiting for me at the bottom uh, with his white light on. I've not called out, I said <laughs> when we came close together. May I speak now? By all means, sir. Uh, good night, then, and here's my hand. Good night, sir, and here's mine. And with that, we walked side by side, probably still holding hands, to his box, entered it, closed the door, and sat down by the fire. I have made up my mind, sir, he began, bending forward as soon as we were seated, and speaking in a tone, eh, but a little above a whisker, uh, whisker, whisper, that you shall not have to ask me twice what troubles me. I took you for someone else yesterday evening. That troubles me. Uh, that mistake? No, that's someone else. Uh, who is it? I don't know. Like me? I don't know. I never saw the face. The left arm is across the face, and the right arm is waved, violently waved, uh, this way. I followed his action with my eyes. <laughs> That's a way of describing that. And it was, I said just like I watched what he did. I followed his action with my eyes. And it was the action of the arm gesticulating with the utmost passion and vehemence. Yeah. For God's sake, clear the way. One moonlit night, said the man, I was sitting here when I heard a, a voice cry, Hello, uh, below there. I started up, looked from that door, and saw someone else standing by the red light near the tunnel. Waving just as I wave now uh, to you. The voice seemed a uh, hoarse, was shouting, and it cried, Look out! Look out! And then, Hello, uh, below there! Look out! I caught my lamp, turned it on red, and ran toward the figure, calling, hey, What's wrong? What's happened? Where? It stood just outside the blackness of the tunnel. I advanced so close upon it that I wondered at its keeping the sleeve across its eyes. I ran right up it and had my hand stretched out to pull the sleeve away when it was gone. Uh, in a tunnel, said I. No. I ran into the tunnel. At 500 yards, I stopped, held my lamp above my head, and saw the figures of the measured distance. I saw the wet stains uh, stealing down the walls and trickling through the arch. I ran out again faster than I had run in. Uh, parentheses, for I had a mortal abhorrence to the place upon me. End parentheses. And I looked all around the red light with my own red light. I went up to the iron ladder, uh, to the gallery atop of it, and I came down again and ran back here. I telegraphed both ways, an alarm has been given. Is anything wrong? And the answer came back, both ways, uh, all well. Resisting the slow touch of a frozen finger, uh, tracing out my spine, I showed him how that this figure must be a deception of his sense of sight, and how figures originating in disease of the delicate nerves the minister of the functions of the eyes uh, were known to have troubled patients, uh, some of whom had become conscious of the nature of their affliction, and had even proved it by experiments upon themselves. As to an imaginary cry, uh, said I, uh, do not listen for a moment to the wind is in a natural valley that we speak so low, and to the uh, wild harp it makes of the telegraph wires. Well, that was all very well. He returned after we had sat listening for a while, and he ought to know something of the wind and the wires. He, who so often passed long winter nights there alone and watching, but he could not uh, beg remark that I had not fished, I asked his pardon. 
and slowly added these words, touching my arm. Within six hours of the appearance, the memorable accident of this line happened, and within ten hours of the dead and wounded were brought along through the tunnel over the spot where the figure had stood. A disagreeable shudder crept over me, but I did my best against it. It is not to be denied. I rejoined that this was a remarkable coincidence, calculated deeply to impress his mind. But it is an unquestionable and remarkable coincidence did not occur that they must be taken into account in dealing with such a subject. Though, uh, to be sure, I must admit, I added, uh, for I thought I saw that he was going to bring the objection to bear upon me. Men of common sense did not allow as much for coincidences in making the ordinary calculations of life. He, began, he again begged to remark that he had not yet finished. I again begged his pardon for being betrayed in, uh, into interruptions. This, he said, again laying his hand upon my arm, lots of touching, and glancing over his shoulder with hollow eyes, was just a year ago. Six or seven months passed, and I had recovered from the surprise and the shock, when one morning, as the day was breaking, I, standing at the door, looked toward the red light, and saw the specter again. He stopped with a fixed look at me. It, did it cry out? No, it was silent. But did it wave its arm? No, it leaned against the shaft of light with both hands before its face, uh, like this. Once more, I followed his action with my eyes. It was an action of mourning. I have seen such an attitude of stone figures on tombs. Hey, did you go up to it? And I came down and sat, uh, partly to collect my thoughts, uh, partly because it, it, turned, it turned me faint. And when I went to the door again, daylight was above me and the ghost was gone. But nothing followed? Uh, nothing came of this? He touched me on the arm with his forefinger, twice or thrice, giving ghastly nod each time. That very day, as a train came out of the tunnel, I noticed that a carriage window on my side would look like a confusion of hands and heads, and something waved, and I saw just in time to signal the driver, hey, Stop! He shut off and put his brake on, but the train drifted past. Here, 150 yards more, oh, I ran after it, and as I went along, I heard terrible screams and cries. A beautiful uh, young lady had died instantly on one of those compartments and was brought in here and laid down on the floor between us. Burp. Involuntarily, I pushed my chair back as I looked for the boards for the, where he pointed to himself. Uh, true, sir, true, precisely as it happened, and so I tell you. Burp. I actually had dinner, so there's a reason why I'm burping. I could think of nothing to say uh, to any purpose, and my mouth was uh, mm, very dry. Uh, the wind and the wires took up the story with a long, lamenting wail. He resumed, Now, sir, mark this, and judge how my mind is troubled. The specter came back a week ago. Yeah, ever since, it had been there now and again by fits and starts. At the light? At the danger light. Oh, what, is, what does it seem to do? He repeated, if possible, with increased passion and vehemence, that former gesticulation of, for God's sake, clear the way. And then he went on, and I have no peace or rest for it. It calls to me, for many minutes uh, together in an agonized manner. Below there, look out, look out, it stands waving to me, and it, it, it rings my little bell. Now I caught that. And did it ring your bell yesterday evening uh, when I was here or when you went to the door? Twice. Why, I see, said I, how your imagination misleads you. And my eyes were on the bell, and my ears were open uh, to the bell. Mm. And if I were a living man, it did not, in all caps, ring at those times. No, nor at any other time except when it was rung in the natural course of physical things by the station communicating with you. Yeah, he shook his head. I Never made a mistake as to that yet, sir, and I have never confused the specter ring with the man's. The ghost's ring is a strange vibration in the bell that derives from nothing else. And I have not asserted uh, that the bell stirs to the eye. I don't wonder that you failed to hear it, but I heard it. And did the specter seem to be there when you looked out? It was. Both times? He repeated firmly, both times. Will you come to the door with me and look for it now? He bit his underlip as though he were somewhat unwilling, but arose. I opened the door and stood on the step uh, while well, he stood in the doorway. Uh, there was danger light in his dismal mouth of the tunnel. There were the high, uh, wet stone walls of the cutting, and there were stars high above them. And did you see it? I asked him, taking particular note of his face. Uh, his eyes were prominent and strained, but not very much more so, perhaps, uh, than my own had been when I 
Distra- directed them earnestly toward the same spot. No, he answered. It's not there. Agreed, said I. We went in again and shut the door and resumed our seats. It's not a back and forth. I was thinking uh, how best to improve this advantage, if it might be called one, when he took up the conversation in such a matter-of-course way, so assuming that there would be no serious question of fact between us, that I felt myself placed by the weakest position. Uh, By this time, you will fully understand, sir, he said, that what troubles me so dreadfully is the question, what does the specter mean? I was not sure, I told him. I did not fully understand. Uh, What is its warning against, he said, ruminating with his eyes on the fire. And only by times returning them on me. Uh, What is the danger? Where is the danger? There is danger overhanging somewhere on the line. Some dreadful calamity will happen. It's not to be doubted his third time uh, after what has gone before. But surely this is a cruel haunting of me in italics. What can I do? He pulled out his handkerchief and wiped the drops from his heated forehead. If I telegraph danger on either side of me, or both, uh, I could give no reason for it, he went on, wiping his palms of the hands. I should get into trouble and do no good. They would think I was mad. This is the way it would work. Message. Danger. Take care. Answer. What danger? Where? Message. I don't know. For God's sake, take care. Uh, They could displace me. Uh, What else could they do? His pain of mind was most pitiable to see, and it was mental torture of a conscientious man, oppressed beyond endurance by unintelligible responsibility involving life. When it uh, first stood under the danger light, he went on, putting his dark hair back from his head and drawing his hands outward across his temples in the extremity of feverish distress. Uh, Why not tell me where the accident was to happen, uh, if it must happen? And why not tell me how it could be averted, and if it could be averted? When on its second coming, it hid its face. Why not tell me instead? She is going to die. Let her, let them keep her at home. If it came on those two occasions, only to show me that its warnings were true, and so to prepare for the third, why not warn me plainly now? And I, Lord help me, a mere poor signalman on his solitary station. Why not go to somebody uh, with credit uh, to be believed and power to act? When I saw him in the state, I saw the poor man's sake, that, as well as for public safety, that I had to do for the time was to compose his mind. Therefore, setting aside all question of reality or unreality between us, I represented to him that whoever thoroughly discharged his duty must do well, and that at least was the comfort that he understood his duty. Though he did not understand these confounding appearances, in his effort I succeeded far better than at the attempt to reason him out of his conviction. Uh, he became calm. Now, the occupations incidental to his post, as the night advanced, began to make larger demands of his attention, and I left him at two in the morning. Uh, I had offered to stay through the night, but he would not hear of it. That, he basically kicked him out. Weird. Like, how far does this guy have to walk to get back to his hotel? That I more than once looked back at the red light as I ascended the pathway, that I did not like the red light, and that I should have slept but poorly if my bed had been under it, I see no reason to conceal. Nor did I like the two sequences of the accident and the dead girl. I see no reason to conceal that either. What ran most of my thoughts was the consideration of how I ought to act. Having become the recipient of this disclosure, I had proven the man to be intelligent, that vigilant, painstaking, and exact, but, but how might he remain so in this state of mind? Through a subordinate position, still he held the most important trust, and I, for instance, like to stake my life on the chance of his continuing to execute it with precision, question mark, unable to overcome the feeling that there would be some... Turn the page. Uh, sorry. Thing! (laughs) Treacherous. I just, like, kind of zoned out there for a while. In my communicating what he had told me to his superiors in the company, uh, without first being plain with himself and proposing a middle course to him, I ultimately resolved to offer to accompany him, otherwise uh, keeping a secret for the present, to the wisest uh, medical practitioner we could hear in those parts, and to take his opinion. Uh, A change in this time of duty would come round next night, and he apprised me that he would be off for an hour or two after sunrise, and on again soon after sunset, and I had appointed to return accordingly. Next evening, 
Ah, it was a lovely evening, and I walked out early to enjoy it. Ah, the sun was not quite down when I traversed the field path near the top of the deep cutting, and I would extend my walk for an hour. I said to myself, uh, half an hour and uh, half an hour back, that it would be the time to go to my signalman's box. Mm-hmm. Before pursuing my, pursuing my stroll, I stepped to the brink and mechanically looked down. From the point from which I had first seen him, I cannot describe the thrill that seized upon me. I think he's falling in love with this guy. When, close at the mouth of the tunnel, I saw the appearance of a man with his left sleeve across his eyes, passionately waving his right arm. The nameless horror that oppressed me passed in a moment, for in a moment I saw this appearance of a man was a in man indeed, and that there was a, a little group of other men standing at the short distance, to whom he seemed to be rehearsing the gesture he made. Uh, the danger light was not yet lighted, and against its shaft a little low hut, entirely new to me, had been made of some wooden supports and tarpaulin. It looked no bigger than a bed. With an irresistible sense that something was wrong, and with a flashing, self-reproachful fear that fatal mischief had come to my leaving the man there and causing no one to be sent to overlook or correct what he had did, I, I descended the notched path with all the speed I could make. And what's the matter? I asked the men. Yeah, Sigmund killed this morning, sir. Uh, not the man belonging to that box. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, not the man I know. You will recognize him, sir, if you knew him, said the man who spoke for the others, solemnly uncovering his own head and raising an end of the tarpaulin. For his face is quite composed. Oh, how did this happen? How did this happen? I asked, turning from one to another as a hut closed again. Ah, he cut down by an engine, sir. No man in England knew his work better, but somehow eh, he was not clear of the outer rail. It, it was just a broad day. He struck the light, it had the lamp on his hand. As the engine came out of the tunnel, uh, his back was toward her. It, he's cut her down. That man drove her. It was uh, showing how it happened. Show, uh, show the gentleman, Tom. The man who wore a rough, dark dress stepped back to his former place at the mouth of the tunnel. Uh, coming around the curve of the tunnel, sir, he said. I saw him at the end, like as if I saw him down a perspective glass. Uh, there was no time to check speed, and I knew him to be very careful, as he didn't seem to be taking heed of the whistle. I shut it off, and we were running down upon him, and I called him as loud as I could. Hey, wh wh what did you say? Oh, I said, uh, below there, look out, look out for God's sake, clear the way. I started. Ah, it was a dreadful time, sir. I never left off calling to him. But I put my arm before my eyes, not to see, and I waved uh, this arm uh, to the last, uh, but it was of no use. I hope he describes in a weird way, watching him do it. Nope, without prolonging the narrative to dwell on any one of its curious circumstances more than any other, I may, in closing it, point out the coincidence that the warning of the engine driver included not only the words which was unfortunate signalman had repeated to me as haunting him, but also the words which I myself not he had attached, and that only in my own mind to the gesticulation he had imitated. Well, there you go. Uh, brief rundown of the story. Man sees another man working a little train box. And he scares that train box man. And then we get to spend a couple pages talking about how he walked down the side of this uh, cliff face. It gets down to him, and here's the story about how this man keeps seeing a ghostly figure covering his eyes with one arm and uh, gesticulating wildly with the other, saying, hello there, clear the tracks, for God's sake, clear the tracks. And every time that happens, something horrible happens, like a train derails and people die. Uh, so, that's pretty much most of the story, and then in the end, a uh, man comes back to visit, and, uh, and take over for him, I think, was the deal, so he can go see a therapist, and then, um, turns out he got killed, because an actual real human man, uh, was waving at him, saying, hello there, clear the tracks, for God's sakes, clear the tracks. So, uh... He basically, it seems like a lot of these stories that I'm reading from this book are just about foreseeing your own death. Except this one involved the death of other people leading up to him foreseeing his own death. So maybe he'll close the circle. Uh, what's good about this story? It was pretty good. 
Uh, I remember reading this a long, long time ago, back when I was uh, simply a teenager in the 1990s, and thinking, nah, well, that's a fairly creepy story. And it still is to this day, so that's good. Uh, what's bad about it? No one's really talking about the real story going on. The story less spoken. About all the touching of the legs and thighs. About all the hand-holding. About the, uh, the, the moment of where they were going to... Uh, solidify their affections for each other by sleeping over. But at the last minute, the man is like, no, this isn't right. You shouldn't sleep over. Go home. Walk that half hour home at two in the morning. That's the real story. And then he comes back and finds that his one true love has been murdered by a train. Well, yeah, they were different times. Charles Dickens wanted to tell a certain story and he had to, uh, dress it up as a different one to tell the story he really wanted to tell. So we read a love story, a sad story of loss and ghosts. Uh, what did we learn? Nah, I guess just that we learned, uh, learned that you get distracted easily by ghosts. If someone was hitting on me, if there's a woman actually interested in me and she was uh, trying to flirt and show interest and and normally I would be a, a willing and receptive person, but if there was a ghost sitting next to me, I think I'd spend the whole time being like, eh, yeah, yeah, that, that's nice, and I'll stop touching me. There's a ghost over here. Do you see it? And I'd just be really boring, constantly talking about the details of the ghost. It's, I think it's wearing a wig. Do you see it? Do you see the wig? Just, and then she'd get up and leave eventually, and I think that's kind of what happened here. Uh, but in the end, he died anyway, so doesn't matter. With that, uh, thanks for listening. And get ready for our uh, one last Halloween episode uh, of the of the year. It's sad to see October go. <laughs> <laughs>